Hello, Heritage. I want to welcome all of you from all of our locations to this location as just one church. Man, this has been fantastic. I've been weeping just nearly the whole time over here. And I am so glad you're here. And if you're a guest with us, I'm especially glad you've chosen to be with us on this important celebration. I am grateful for all the volunteers and leaders who have helped pull this thing together, for us to spend some time reflecting and celebrating. I'm also grateful for all the people over the last 50 years who have helped make what Heritage is today. It was Easter 1965 that Heritage had its first formal gathering as one church in one location worshiping one Lord here in the Quad Cities. Fifty years later we still worship that one Lord. We worship in multiple locations but we are still one church. Just one church. We live and work and serve all over the Quad Cities, but we are one church. And it actually reminds me of the words of Paul, the missionary and church planter, when he wrote a letter to the believers, the followers of Jesus in the city of Ephesus. He said that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There is just one. Just one. And you know what? Sometimes it takes only one to make a huge difference for everything to change. Uh, one is a game changer. It's true if uh, you're doing something simple like putting together a puzzle or you're putting a, a series of dominoes together. One piece changes everything, right? It's true if you're cruising down the highway and you decide to go into the HOV lane as you're driving and you're missing that one other person. It's a little more costly. But even just consider that a cup of water that is at 211 degrees is just hot but with one degree more at 212, it's boiling. One is a game changer. And sometimes it only takes one to change everything. One more chance. One more opportunity with a loved one. One do-over, just one. One is a game changer. And the reality is that most of us are just one decision away from a breakthrough in life. Just one. One bold move of faith can change a trajectory, can transform a life, and most are just missing that one. Just one. You know, I love the the stories of the men who followed Jesus, we call them disciples. They were just ordinary men, but man, they struggled like we do. They struggled with faith and unbelief, and they made mistakes. They messed up just as much as we do, but they had something. They were committed to one thing that set them apart, and that was a willingness to risk in faith by making bold moves. Bold moves. And the reality is, that whenever God wants to do something significant in this world, he often just wants one person to step with a bold move of faith to make that thing happen. Just one. And one of those examples comes at the end of the Gospel of John, uh, the fourth book in the New Testament written by the disciple John. And if you've got a Bible with you, I want to encourage you to turn to it or click to it if you can. But in John chapter 21, we're picking up a story where Jesus has been crucified, he died, his body is missing, the disciples are in struggle, they're confused, they don't understand what's happened, they're trying to make sense of it, and in the confusion, they revert. They go back to what is safe, they go back to fishing. 
I can just picture that scenario going down. They're hanging out. They don't know what to do. And it's kind of like the vultures in the original Jungle Book movie on the branch going, uh, what do you want to do? I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what do you want to do. Until Peter goes, hey, I'm going fishing. And the others, with nothing better to do, decide to go with him. Now, we can often revert to what is familiar and comfortable when, when we're struggling because it's, there's, there's no risk, little risk. But every time we do that, we position ourselves where our ability to see all that God wants in our life is challenged. But that's what these guys do. They decide to go fishing, and they do it all night. All night long they fish. In fact, fishing in these days was best done at night. It was the preferred time. And if you've, they go and spent the whole night and they catch nothing. And if you've ever spent the night working a shift up all night, trying to accomplish a project, doing something, and as, the, as you do that, you know that is mentally challenging, emotionally challenging, physically demanding. And if what you're investing in is not working well, <laughs> man, your fatigue leads to grumpiness. And that's kind of where we pick up where these guys are at the next morning. They haven't caught anything. But then there's this guy over on the shore who hollers to them a standard fishing question. Have you caught any what? Fish. Now that could have been an irritating question. They could have been tempted to say, Nunya, which is the Greek for none of your business. But they don't. They say no. And then the same guy has the audacity to tell them how to fish. He says, throw the net on the other side. Again, they could have been upset by that, irritated by that. These guys were the fishermen. That was presumptuous of him. But for whatever reason, they do it. They throw the net on the other side and they catch fish. But not just one fish, not just two fish, a whole lot of fish. So many fish, they can't get the net into the boat. It's a miracle. And here's the interesting part. Here's where this thing starts to turn for me. At this point, John, the guy who's writing this book, John 21 chapter, he's... He's the one writing this. He, he, rec he recognizes the man on the shore from the miracle as Jesus. It goes back to his original calling. It's a similar scenario. Luke 5, you can check it out sometime, but he realizes it's Jesus and he says, it's the Lord. And at this point, Peter, man, Peter steps up and he makes a bold move. Now, how many of you, by show of hands, know how to swim? Just put your hand up and keep it up. If you know how to swim, put your hand up and keep it up. All right, great. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Those of you that know how to swim, have you or would you ever jump out of a boat? Put your hand up if you would. All right. Most people would. Okay, now keep your hand up. Now when you jump out of a boat, would you first put on a coat or overcoat or more clothes to do that? No. no. Peter does what no rational person would do. He gets dressed to go swimming. He puts more clothes on. Scripture says he, wrapped, he took his outer garment, wrapped it around him because he had taken it off, and he jumped in the water. Now, my friends, listen. That was a bold move. Bold. Now, some of you are like, no, Sean, that wasn't bold. That was silly. Makes no sense. Listen, hold that thought. We've already established it's not all that big of a deal to jump out of a boat. Many of us would do that. And if you look around, many of us know how to put more clothes on and get dressed, right? And I'm glad you did before you came here. But listen, when you put those two things together, it is. See, I am convinced that Peter believed that he was going to walk to Jesus. He was going to walk, just like he had done in another part of Scripture. I believe that Peter jumped out of that boat thinking he was going to walk on water again, not swim. But whether that's the case or not, I'll tell you this, he didn't care that it wasn't another walk on water experience. He didn't even care what the other disciples thought. He just swam that hundred yards back to shore as fast as he could, with his eyes fixed on Jesus. He wanted to get there while the other six disciples rowed the boat, pulling the fish in tow. Listen, Spiritual boldness is not brash, it's sacrificial. Spiritual boldness is not selfish, it's selfless. And it's expectant, with no strings attached. That even though we 
The thing we're trying to do may not actually work out. It doesn't matter when we live spiritually bold. It doesn't stop us. Now listen, Peter was a guy who, I say he struggled with foot and mouth disease. He repeatedly said things he shouldn't have said. He did things he shouldn't have said. And and the most recent thing was the three denials of his Savior. And at this point, he had to be bearing the weight of that reality, the failures in his life. He had to be reviewing the three denials. He had to be reviewing the desire to build some kind of shelter at the transfiguration. He had to be reviewing the fact that Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He had to be reviewing the fact that the last time he walked on water, he actually sank at the end of it. Peter was a guy who struggled with foot and mouth disease. But when he saw that it was Jesus, when he knew it was Jesus, he knew he had to go. He knew he had to make a bold move, and he, in bold, bold move, and he fixed his eyes on Jesus, and he went, making that the highest priority for him. And that changed everything. He made that bold move. Now, when he gets to shore, when everybody gets to shore, they end up having breakfast. Jesus says, get some fish. <laughs> Peter went and got all 153 fish. And then, and then Jesus begins to care for their physical and spiritual needs. He begins to feed and teach them, and, and especially Peter. And if you've read ahead or you're familiar with this passage, you know that Jesus refers to Peter as Simon at this point. See, Peter was originally called Simon, but Jesus gave him a new name, Peter, which means rock. And Simon was an impetuous fisherman, which is exactly who he'd been the night before in this case. But Peter was a world changer. One on whom Jesus would build the church. And Jesus, by calling him Simon, is taking Peter back in their journey, back in their relationship to the beginning, so he begins to walk him forward from there. And he does it by asking three questions and giving three directives. They're very similar. They're basically, do you love me, then show me, kind of thing. And there's some nuances in what Greek words were used for love, and there's deep meaning in that, but I just want to focus on the first interaction where Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Verse 15, he says that, and, and, and Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, it's a pretty good question that Jesus asked, do you love me? And it's a question we all need to answer at some point. Yeah, but it seems really clear and kind of straightforward. But, but then you start to look at the question, and I wonder who or what are these more than these? When Jesus asked that question, he's saying, Peter, do you love me more than you love these, your brothers, the other six that were with you? Was he saying, Peter, do you love me more than these guys love me? Or was he saying, Peter... Do you love me more than these things, this fishing tackle, this stuff that represents your career and your aspirations? Do you love me more than these? I think it's all three. Because Jesus wasn't asking Peter these three questions so that Jesus could know and actually be sure Peter loved him. He knew Peter loved him. Peter declared it, but Jesus already knew it. And he wasn't just asking three questions to have the parallel to the three denials and sync that up, which that's certainly part of it. He asked three questions, though, so that Peter would know that he loved Jesus. Because when you and I make mistakes, we doubt, and we question, and we tend to drift away from our one true love. And Peter needed to know that he did love Jesus because that love would take him to the grave. It would mean his death. And in some way, Jesus is saying, Peter, how far will you go? How bold will you be? How sacrificial will you be? How committed will you be? Because my friends, listen, it's it's one thing to say we love God. It's a very different thing to demonstrate that and show Him in how we live. To trust Him, to obey Him, to risk. To risk beyond recovery but not beyond His cover. To, To be willing to leap boldly out of a boat not knowing the outcomes. Look, see, what happens in this whole journey is that most of us are just one bold move away from a breakthrough. One bold move. 
For Peter, this whole interaction led to the restoration and reconciliation of his relationship with Jesus. And he would go on to leave everything to follow Jesus to the point of death so the church would be built upon him. Most of us are just one bold move away from a breakthrough. You know, this uh, awesome representation of the I-74 bridge behind me, isn't this cool? This thing is awesome. It's even got a couple of owls up on top. But listen, this is, a, this is a landmark in the Quad Cities. This is a place that has historical background and it represents relationship between two states and multiple cities. And, and it's a monument. But bridges are built to be places that facilitate movement. And when they don't facilitate movement, ain't nobody happy. If you have ever been stuck on or at a Quad City Bridge, raise your hand really high, really high, and say, Amen. Amen. Oh, man, nobody's happy when these things don't facilitate movement. Bridges are designed to facilitate movement, but they can become monuments. And the same is true for the church. The church was birthed to be the facilitator of a movement but it can become a monument when it stops making bold moves for Jesus. This bridge represents where God has placed us, our mission field. There are more than 400,000 sheep, lambs. Many of them walk with Jesus, but just as many don't. And we're positioned to strive to live loved as we profess our love for the one Lord. But then we're also positioned to live linked, as we are reconciled in relationship to him, as well as reconciled in relationship to others. But we are also positioned to live sent, as we boldly follow Jesus wherever he leads, assisting those who know him and reaching those who don't. Look, this this bridge represents our mission field. And God is increasingly asking of us that we would position ourselves as Heritage Church increasingly so that that our impact in these cities is so strong, so meaningful that if we weren't here, it would significantly matter. Listen, because here's the thing. If we follow Jesus, it's not enough that our hearts are different. Our cities should be as well. Let me say that again. If we follow Jesus, it is not enough that our hearts are different. Our cities should be as well. That's the reality of the gospel. And for 50 years, we have been creating and extending bridges into new relationships. Every time we make an investment, it's like laying an I-beam for the bridge that, that leads to hope that leads to reconciliation that leads to relationship that leads to God and we are not yet done we're still building bridges into new relationships we're doing that specifically as we prepare to launch Vida Nueva into the Floresiente neighborhood just this past week Ben and I were down at the Erickson school building and we're talking about some of the things that God is doing and preparing for us to do and I want to take a moment I want to share some of those things with you. So check this out. All right, hello Heritage. We are on our way to the Erickson School Building to check out a little bit more about what God is doing as we prepare for this season of transition. And I have Pastor Ben with me. Hello Heritage. And here we are at the Erickson School Building, the future home of Vida Nueva. So this is one of the main entrances into the Erickson School Building, where Mm -hmm. students and parents and families have used this entrance for years to come in for education, for classes, uh, for different events and celebrations, but now it will be one of the main entrances for our Vida Nueva family. Yes, and it's exciting, you know, to be able to get into this building, a building that was used, of course, for education for many years, but also it was used to gather the community here. And uh, I can just imagine how many events happened right here. And uh, so this is really a community building. Yeah, it it hasn't just been an elementary school. It's been a place of hope for the community. 
whether it's through that training, through those classes, through different programs, it's been a place of hope. And one of the great things about what God is doing in this transition is he's positioning us to be part of facilitating the building to be an even greater place of hope through the reality that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Yes. So yes. one of the exciting things we get to do with you right now is to let you know the name that we've identified for this building in the new season. And it's a name that captures the heart and vision around what God has asked us to do. And uh, Ben, I'm gonna let you tell him what that name is. Thank you. Uh, this building is going to be called Esperanza Center. And Esperanza, which is a Spanish word, means hope. And this is definitely going to be a center for hope for the people of this neighborhood. Yeah. It's an exciting reality that this will continue to be a place of hope for not only the members of the Floresiente neighborhood, but neighborhoods even beyond. Yes. As we continue to lift up the name of Jesus and mm -hmm. continue to serve and love the people of the Quad Cities and beyond. Yes. So let's head on into the gymnasium and uh, talk about what's going to happen in there. Okay. So obviously this is the school gymnasium and for years has been used for lots of different events and activities. But one of the things we envision in this next season is the ability for more than 300 people to gather in this space, to worship, to pray, to study God's word, and, and essentially do life together. Yes. And as I look around and think about being in a way of a relocating here, it starts to stir my heart. But I wonder what stirs your heart most? What gets you most excited when you think about the relocation to this facility? You know, Sean, what stirs my heart probably the most is to be able to be a church, be the church in a different way, in a way that uh, we've not done in the last 11 years. To be able to come in right into the community and, and live among the people and do life with them, and be able to, you know, put up tables and, and have a meal together, not only with the church, but with the community. And just to open it up to so many ways that God wants to reach into this community. Yeah, that's one of the things that for me, it gets me excited, just the, the reality that, that this space and this building has lots of multi-use realities. Yes. An ability to connect with people, to love and serve people in lots of different ways. But doing that from the reality that we are the church and we don't just go to church. And so I'm excited about what's gonna happen in this space. Yeah, so am I. So let's go check out uh, Classroom. Okay. okay, let's do that. Oh man, I am so excited. That is just a glimpse into what God is doing. And I really want to encourage you to, to go through HeritageQC.com, click the Esperanza tab and banner, and, and, and stay up to date with what's going on as we continue to upload information to that site. Because you're going to find spaces in there for how to, how to know how to go, how to give, and how to pray. And, and the reality is that much of what has already happened is a direct result of prayer. We need more people to continue to pray that God would go before us. Just the fact that we're having this building, we're going to receive this building, that is a direct answer to prayer. And beyond the prayer are opportunities for us as a church family to engage as we go, as we serve. As we go through the retrofit process, there'll be opportunities for you to invest through projects and, and part of that retrofit journey. You can invest with the Vida Nueva family and the ministry that, is, that they're going to be doing as well as partnering in the community-based ministries that we're going to be doing out of that facility, through that facility, and around that facility. Beyond that is an opportunity to also give, to give to the greater vision. The, the retrofit of the Esperanza Center will, will be about $400,000 alone, and many of you have already started to give to that. We're well on our way to that, but listen, that doesn't begin to cover the launching and preparation of all the life-changing ministries that we're going to be doing out of it let alone the additional campuses and locations and ministries that we need to be continuing to push on into in the next season. What we're really talking about are millions of dollars over the next three to five years and tens of millions of dollars for ten years and beyond. But as God calls us to step into this moment, He will provide what we need and He does it through the faithfulness of His people. Because here's the thing, the Esperanza Center and the Move of Vida and all that's going on there, that is just one of the bold moves that God is asking of us, just one. And there are more to come, and I look forward to sharing them with them with you, but I want to tell you about two. I want to tell you about two. In this year, we are going to be partnering with a Quad City Area School to provide tutoring and mentoring and after-school programs for vulnerable children. 
We're going to come alongside those students, and we're going to have the opportunity to partner with a school specifically in West Davenport. And I can't wait to share more of those details with you as we finalize that relationship. And that's just one opportunity for us to make a bold move as we live sent. Beyond that, in the, in the 2016 and 2017 church year, we're going to be launching a new campus. We are currently pretty well present in places like Rock Island and, and Moline and Bettendorf. But we as a church family are not highly engaged in the largest municipality within the Quad Cities, Davenport. There's more than 100,000 people in Davenport. And in this next season, God is asking us to launch a campus in that, in that area. Here's the crazy cool thing. He's already raising up leadership to do it. I absolutely love it. But listen, that is, that, that's just the beginning because I see at least seven other campuses and church plants over the next 10 years. There are 200,000 people who do not know Jesus. Now look, this isn't just about us. This isn't just a mission for us. This is for the Big C Church. And so we will be partnering with our sister churches in the Quad Cities. And inviting them to come alongside. We'll be, we'll be partnering and empowering, positioning churches and organizations to get involved in doing the work that God has called us to do. Because listen, we cannot just say to people that God loves them. We've got to show them. We've got to go. When we go and we show them, that, that's part of the reason that Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. He connected the two. And, and, and feeding his sheep and taking care of his lambs, that, that's meeting multiple needs, different kinds of needs. And that will mean new opportunities, new challenges, new locations. But we get to go and be part of that. And God's calling us to it. It's not enough that our hearts are different. Our cities should be as well. On your way in, you hopefully received a card that, that looks like this. I want you to grab it for me. Take it out for a moment. You're going to see on it just a, a great spot for lots of good information. It's got some cool data I love. I love that we can celebrate knowing more than 2,800 people have made decisions for Jesus in the last 10 years. That is awesome. And what, we can add 11 more from this past week. 11 more. I love it. There's lots of good information here. There's information on the back. I'll talk about some of that here in a moment. But I want to draw your attention to the lower portion that says, My Bold Move. In fact, let's just all tear that off right now. Just fold it over and rip it off. Listen, most of us are just one bold move away from a breakthrough. And I wonder what yours is. Around our church family, we talk about living loved and living linked and living sent. And you may find that your next bold move actually involves moving through all three. We, we saw as we looked at Peter's journey just in John 21 that he moved through all three. First thing he needed to do was to reaffirm his love for his Lord. Then he needed to reconcile his relationship to be lived linked. But then he ultimately had to choose to commit everything he was to follow and live sent. Your next bold move may involve moving through all three, but here's the deal. What's your move? You've got one. You're still here. God is not done with you yet. For some of you, your next bold move centers around living loved. It's time. It, this is the day where you're going to cast off every inhibition. You're going to throw everything aside, and you're going to jump. And you don't care what anybody else thinks. You're going to jump in that water, and you're going to walk or swim because you know you need to get to Jesus. It has been far too long, the distance and space. You've reverted the things you shouldn't be reverting back to, and it is an opportunity for you for the first time or for, once again, to say you love him to surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior, to find forgiveness, receive the gift of eternal life, and begin to walk with God as you live loved today. For some of you, that's your first and foremost bold move. For some of you, it has to do with being linked. You are currently out of fellowship and out of relationship with someone else in your life. You have a relationship that needs to be reconciled. You need to extend forgiveness or seek forgiveness. And God's pushing on you, saying, until you, are, until you forgive that other person, you cannot be forgiven by me. And he's saying, you've got to go work that out. For some of you, he's saying, you know what? For far too long you've been on the outside. You need to step into serious relationship in the community. You need to be in a small group. You need to connect with others so that you live loved and linked and sent together. 
You might be in an opportunity to live linked, challenge. But then there's the opportunity to live sent, to pray, to go, to give. God is actually asking some of us to step in to be a more catalytic influence into the things that he is doing, to pray and to see him move. He responds to the prayers of his people, to sacrificially give, to go and to serve. What's your next bold move? It's not enough just to tell people that he loves them. It's not enough just of our hearts to be changed. Our city should be changed as well. We need to go and be the hands and feet. What is your next bold move? And here's what I want to invite you to do today, right now. I want you to write it down. It may be something else I haven't even mentioned, and that's why there's blank spots on here as well, but you have a bold move. You have a next step that, that is holding you back from experiencing the breakthrough and everything that God has for you. What is your next bold move? I want you to write it down. I want you to declare it. I want you to draw a line in the sand and say, this is my next bold move. And when we make these moments, these make these big bold moves, it ripples into generations. And who knows, a generation 50 years from now, you'll be able to look back and say, here was a group of people who are willing to take a bold step of faith to risk, even though they don't know the outcomes, but to do it in the name of Jesus to see him transform lives, to see him transform these cities. The future generations will be changed. Like the psalmist wrote, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. I want to encourage you to write and declare your bold move. Let's be a people who risk and strive so big that if it works out, God is the only one who can get the credit. Let's be a people who expectantly seek for him to move before us as we work with him so that a generation not yet born may praise the Lord. We're going to step into another moment for us for a song after a quick video. And this video is gonna share a little bit more of our heart behind what it means to make a bold move. And I wanna encourage you in these next few moments to prayerfully consider what God is asking because when that's, when that's done, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to drop this into a bucket as it passes, as a declaration, as a prayer, as an answer to God, as an answer to Jesus who says, do you love me? Yes, I do, Lord, and feed my sheep. What's your next bold move? And as you think through that, check this out. This is Mike. Mike lives in any town. He has a good job and a great group of friends. Now Mike probably doesn't know this, but God loves him and is already at work all around him. In fact, some of Mike's friends already live differently through a relationship with God. They live loved. This brings us to Laura. Laura is one of Mike's friends and she experiences life in a completely different way. Laura knows that God loves her, which enables her to live loved. She also lives linked in relationship with others in a community called the church. Laura's church gathers every week and lives life loved and linked. But the cool thing about them is they don't stop there. They also live sent. So Laura makes a bold move and shares the love of God with Mike. And he learns that through Jesus, he is loved by God and begins to love God in return. Here is the new Mike. Same job, same friends, but now he gets to live as one who is loved and linked and sent. Mike will go on to share the love of God with his friends in any town, in any country, on any continent, all over the world. And that's the way it should be. So what does this mean for us at Heritage? Well, we are striving to be a community that lives on mission and as people who are the church and don't just go to church. We live loved, linked, and sent wherever we go. This is how God seeks to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. In fact, God has already positioned us in locations to take part in an ever-expanding movement of God. And he's increasingly leading us to love and serve the Quad City area and beyond. But it all comes back to you, just one person. Because what impacts many starts with one, just one. One bold move. By just one person, what's your next bold move?